and away we go. All right. We're going to look at trigonometric functions. We're going to look at the inverse trigonometric functions, and then we're going to look at the derivatives of inverse trig functions. So let's start from the beginning. What you have in front here is sine. Let me, uh, let me use a different color here. We are looking at sine. Ooh, sine. That's horrible writing. Sine of x. Y equals sine of x. Pretty easy to see what we're talking about here, but remember now, I want you to think about what I said in the last video. That I'm looking for anywhere, first off, I'm looking for two things. I want to find uh, critical points, critical points, and I want to see where I'm probably going to have uh, two x's happening for one y. Because when I flip it, that's where I'm going to have problems. Now, first off, a few things to think about here. What is what is my what is the period uh, period for for sine? Now, if I look at this, um, it might become a little tricky as to knowing where do I cut it. So let's first just look at all the critical points. Now, it's pretty obvious that I've got something right there, got something right there, got another one right here. We got another one right over here. There's a few. There's a few. They're all placed, but this is expected. My um, my sine function is a uh, a periodic wave. Uh, for those of you doing physics, I have a periodic wave. It's repeating itself over and over again. But I only really need to know one period. So I got to figure out where am I going to where am I going to cut this thing. So this is where it gets kind of interesting. Now, just so it's clear, I mean it's not listed here, but as you may recall. Uh, for example, this point here is not exactly negative three point something something. This is this is really negative pi, and it's better to think of it in terms of that. Let me see. That means this is negative pi over two. This is zero. This right here. What do we got? We got positive pi over two, and then I've got uh, pi. Oh, keep going, keep going. I've got 3 pi over 2. And then lastly, uh, right here, I've got my 2 pi. So remember always that we're talking about this thing rotating around a circle. So sine, uh, one period for sine is going around once. Once around the circle. So the period is 2 pi. My period is equal to 2 pi. Not for all the functions, but for uh, for a sine function, it's 2 pi. So that means I only really need to work with one of them. And I'll get every single thing I need to know for a sine graph. Now, the question is, is that I could start all sorts of places. I could start it, uh, for example, over here at negative 3 pi over 2. Come down and come back up at pi over 2. I could start at uh, negative pi and come over to positive pi. I could start at negative pi over 2 and come down to 3 pi over 2. The question really is, is where am I going to end up cutting this? Because I know what's going to happen when I flip it. In fact, just for fun, let's, uh, let's actually do that flipping now. Now, like I said, uh, to get the inverse function, so we're, we're over, hold on now, before I do this, let me stop what I was about to do. Um, let's just remember what the inverse function is going to look like, or when I do it in math, when I just do it mathematically, I'm going to get x is equal to sine of y, and therefore, therefore, uh, make my little therefore, y is going to be equal to inverse of x. That's going to be my, that's going to be my function. Now, let's consider what we're actually doing, okay? When I start off with y equals sine of x, what exactly is x? Now, 0, pi over 2, pi, 3 pi over 2, 2 pi. These are, so let's just look at this here. x are angles these are angles angles of the circle so i'm talking about the angles as i go around the circle 
And y is what? What do I get? If I say sine of, say, pi over 2 is equal to 1, or perhaps a sine of, uh, what's pi over 4, by the way? Let's just, where is pi over 4? Pi over 4 is somewhere around, somewhere around here. Let's say that's pi over 4. Uh, so sine of uh, example, example, sine of pi over 4 is equal to root 2 over 2. So what is this? Well, it's a ratio. It's a ratio. It's the trigonometric ratios. So when I come over here, what am I saying here? What exactly am I saying? What am I plugging in? That's the important thing we need to think in. In other words, if I'm flipping everything and I say, okay, wait a minute, x is equal to sine of y, the thing I plug in is the ratio. And what I get out is the angle. That's the opposite of what I'm doing originally. So think about that again. I just want to say that one more time. Rather than plugging in an angle into a function and getting a ratio, we instead plug in the ratio and our answer is the angle. Okay? Our y will be the angle. So let's just, for a moment, let me just take this thing now. So, so just Keep that in mind. Keep that in mind. Let's take our function. Okay. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to remember what I said. Um, you are reflecting across y equals x, but you can at the same time do something else. And I'm going to do that now. I'm going to transform this and I'm going to, let me see, I will rotate it in 90 degrees clockwise and then I will flip it horizontally. And let's just go over here and put it in line. More, ooh, not perfect. Not perfect. I might have to stretch a little bit here because I want to make this thing work. Let me see. Stretch it. That's a little stretch. Sorry, guys. Didn't do this perfectly. Oh, pretty close. Pretty close. Doesn't have to be beautiful, but you get the idea. Oh, that's pretty good. So there's my new function. Now, um, let me let me fade off the old one so you can see this better. There, and let's bring this guy up. So, there's my new function. What you have here is y equals inverse sine of x. Here's my new thing. Now, i got to remember, let's erase all this old stuff here. Let's just look at it now. What has happened? What has happened? So, with this, with this, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna draw my, uh, my circle again. Let's draw that circle. Okay. In this case, x's are ratios, and the y's are angles. That's with y equals inverse sine of x. I have flipped everything. So instead of plugging in angles and getting out, sorry, yeah, plugging in angles and getting ratios, I'm doing the opposite. I'm plugging in ratios and getting angles. Now, let's think about that then. That means, uh, hard to see here, but I've got, actually, I can see where I'm going to cut this thing now. Let's just see. Look at this here. To here is one way of doing it, but I could also cut here, here, and it's clear that it, right here, from here to here, I have no repeats. I have no repeats. Let's go back to the original graph. Sine of a function is all about the y values, values of of a circle of, of a point on a circle really of a point on a circle so if i said uh, the angles where do they have 
uh, unique angles for these ratios. Okay, so let me see. If I take um, sine of x and I uh, take, say, this angle here, it will have, say, that's 45. It'll be root 2 over 2 for this sine. Sine of this, sine of this angle will be equal to root 2 over 2. But over here, it is also, it is also root 2 over 2. So that's no good. I don't want that. That's not what I want. I want where sine of theta will be a unique situation. Unique. So where does this happen? And if I just think about it, I want you to think about it only in terms of the circle. Where do I get all different ratios? Okay, they're all unique. Well, if I think about this, let's just think about this. Um, well, I could start here and say, okay, well, all these are unique. They're all different in there. But if I go over here, they're going to be the same as these. So quadrant one and quadrant two are no good. And actually, as it turns out, let me see. I will get unique ones here because they're going to be all negative. So here's my positive and my negatives, and they're all going to be simply um, a bunch of unique ones. These guys here and here are going to be the same as the ones on quadrant 1 and 4. So 2 and 3 I can ignore. If I want to just simply figure out what is the correct range, the correct range, it is clear that going from here to here makes sense. It absolutely makes sense to do it this way. Because what is this? Remember, my y's are my angles. What is this? One point blah blah blah. One point blah 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 is positive pi over 2. And what is this? This is negative pi over 2. And what am I talking about here? From here all the way to here. Positive pi over 2 all the way down to negative pi over 2. And I have within here all of these unique ratios. Everywhere here, all of these here, all of these here gives me unique x values. x values meaning unique ratios. As soon as I come over here now and I start coming back, I've now repeated. I've got, I've got a problem because I have two of the same ratios. I don't want that. So I don't need this anymore. I'm just looking where within the period I'm going to get unique stuff. Now what's interesting is that that's half of my period. It's half of my period. My period is 2 pi. The range of my inverse function, my range of my inverse function is not 2 pi, it's pi. So this is my range. So how do we do this? Well, I've got to actually be pretty clear about this. I've got to, I've got to write down my function, but I've got to indicate specifically how much of this new thing I'm actually using. So if I was going to write this down, let's see, I'm just going to write down uh, y equals inverse sine of x, where y, maybe I shouldn't write that down, hang on now, let me do that again, because y is between two values, isn't it? y must be uh, less than or equal to what? Pi over 2, and greater than or equal to negative pi over 2. And that's the proper way of writing this thing because you have to say where you're going to cut this off. Because you can plug in, um, you can get many, many more y's, it's, uh, but they're going to be the same thing. They're going to give you the same x's. I'm going to have a, a, I'm going to have this situation happen again. I will not have a function. So you have to cut it up. You have to say these are the y's that are allowed. These are the Y's that are allowed. I hope that makes sense. Now let's just uh, for a moment take a look very quickly at a few other functions. I'm going to look at these three here. And uh, I, think, I, I think these are going to be the most useful. Uh, so let's just ask ourselves a few things one at a time here. First, what is the period for each of these? If you don't know what the period is, you're going to have problems. So remember, what you learned in uh, pre-calc, uh, 12 and 11, I guess, in that case, both both years, uh, is going to become very important now. So the period for uh, cosine x, uh, hopefully you realize it is 2 pi. Tan x, what is the period there? 
Um, that is um, pi, remember? I hope you remember that. And the period for secant x, well, that is 1 over cosine, which means I'm going to have, uh, hopefully, the same period as well. It should be a 2 pi as well. And then repeats again, repeats again, repeats again. It, it should be unique in the same way cosine is unique to each other. Now, what is the next thing we need to do? Uh, where are, once again, where do I have unique, unique ratios? All right, that's what I want to know. Unique ratios. Where does it happen? Where? So remember, sine, sine I had it all where I had, say, um, from positive pi over 2 to negative pi over 2. But when we're looking at cosine, let's think about that. Um, I would be looking at where the x values are all different. And so what I'm looking at there is really from, and ironically, half of my period. From here to here, I should have unique ratios because of course if I say I looked at this for example this and this these two angles would have the same ratio because I don't care about why it would have a positive x over the radius positive x over the radius for this one too they're going to be the same so that's not really very useful to use these twice so when I look at this that means my what is going to be my um my cutoff points well kind of obvious i can go from let me see uh zero to pi um what else but i could if i wanted i could say well you know what um i don't want to use those i'm going to cut it off from here to here well what would that be well that would be from pi to two pi you could use that when you cut it you could use that as the range you will cut and you would still get um a proper inverse function when you said y was uh, equal to inverse cos of x. Now what about tan? Well I've got, um, I've got kind of an interesting one here. Let me think about this now. Okay how would I do this? I've got, well you know what maybe we need to look at the function because this might help us a little bit. Now, tangent is a little different. Tangent is an interesting situation because I can see right here it's going from what looks to me like uh, negative pi over 2 to positive pi over 2, and then I have those vertical asymptotes. They're not drawn on this uh, graph, but you can see where they're going to be. And what's interesting is that because of the shape of the tangent function all the way between negative pi over 2 and positive pi over 2 I am getting unique values for tangent and then it repeats again uh, does not include does not include negative pi over 2 and pi over 2 because uh, there is no value for there so I have to be a, a little careful about how I want to say that but knowing that knowing that let me see that's kind of interesting because if you look at that, let's see. So what am I saying here? What what exactly am I suggesting? I'm saying that if I go from, let me see, I'll change my color here. Negative pi over 2, all right, all the way to, whoops, sorry, there's negative pi over 2, all the way up to positive pi over 2. It happens to be the entire period. So I could say it's from negative pi over 2 to pi over 2. Um, not including them, of course. So I would have to be a little careful about how I say that. But that would be my range. I could, um, once again, I can pick another one as well. I can pick another one. And uh, I could pick, okay, I'm going to go from pi over 2 up to 3 pi over 2. Perhaps I prefer that. In other words, let's let's just go back to the graph for a second. Just remember that pi over two to three pi over two. So there's here's pi over two, and then what am I going all the way up to? Three pi over two, which is about four point something. So I'm using this whole line right here as the thing I'm going to look at, and they repeat one. They all repeat. So I just need one of these lines, and I can use the whole line. I don't have to cut this up because, as you can see, 
Remember what we said in the original video there. Uh, this is a, a potential uh, critical point here because at this point um, I have a change. I'm going from a increase to an increase. Um, it is not actually uh, changing on either side of my derivative. I, I'm not having an increase and decrease, which happens with my sine function. For example, let's uh, just quickly look at sine function there. Ah, if I look here, I'm going increase, decrease, and this becomes a very important point. But with tangent, not not exactly the same situation at all here, even though I have, I've got a change in my curvature, my double derivative is different, I will have um, a continuous function along here that does not need to be cut up. Okay, so that's tangent. So what about secant? How does secant look? Well, once again, maybe we should look at it. But remember, it's related to cosine x. So I'm assuming I got a the same thing happening. But just, just to be sure and make sure everyone else who's watching this video sees what happens, let's take a look at that. How do we cut this up? How do we... How do we cut this thing up? Um, this is a very interesting situation. So what I have here, if you look here from 1 to 6.2 odd, uh, in other words, from 0 to 2 pi, I have this, then this, then this, and I've got them into sort of this interesting shape, as you would expect, 1 over cosine. But... Uh, that would be the thing that repeats from if, if I look at the next one, it repeats just like this. I would start from here again and make the little curve up, then the, the sort of the upside down quadratic there, and then another half up here. So this is my entire thing, but where do I cut it where it's going to be unique? Well, this is a piece that's unique, and then this is a piece that's unique, but I got to cut. I got to cut right here where I have what looks to me like a horizontal slope because this part will end up repeating what I just looked at and this will repeat this one over here so really I'm looking from here to what looks like I think it's pretty obvious where it is looks like at pi so how ironic it looks like what we're talking about here is that my period will be exactly the same the sorry the unique ratio it's not the period but the the ratios that I'm looking for are once again exactly the same as my cosine. I'm still going to have 0 to pi as the unique ratios that I'm looking for. And you can keep doing this with all the other ratios if you want. The, all the, sorry, the, all the other trigonometric functions you want. They all can be looked at this way. The question, of course, is, is then um, how do you get the derivatives? All we've got so far is we're making sure that we know how to make the functions into inverse functions and how to specifically say where that function is because we got to cut it up. You have no choice. You have to cut it up. But once again, with all of these, if you look at all of them, where are we cutting? We're cutting at critical points. Critical points or where we have something undefined, which is close to critical points in most cases um, not in the case of tangent but still you can tell exactly where you have to cut it because we're cutting at the asymptotes okay i hope that helps we're going to talk about um derivatives later okay bye